This lecture is organized by Dr. Alemi. Uh, the lecture is based on the open book statistics books but does include additional information. Sampling refers to the process of examining a subset of cases to infer the rate in the entire population. Sampling randomly helps reduce bias. If someone was permitted to pick and choose exactly what was included in a sample, it's entirely possible that the sample could be skewed to that person's interest. It's easy to game it. This introduces bias into a sample. Randomization avoids bias. The act of taking a simple random sample helps minimize bias. However, bias can crop up in other ways, even when people are picked at random. Caution must be exercised if the non-response rate is high. For instance, if only 30% of the people randomly sampled for a survey actually responded to the survey, then it's not clear whether the results are representative of the entire population. Non-response bias can skew results. For example, angry patients do not take satisfaction surveys, causing a response bias. Satisfaction surveys are more positive than the true reality. Another common bias is a convenience sample, where individuals who are easily accessible are more likely to be included in the sample. These individuals do not represent the entire picture. For example, people who hang up on automated telephone systems are not included in the counts of satisfied customers usually taken at the end of the survey, at the end of the telephone interaction. Confounding variables affect both the explanatory variable and the response. If confounding variables are not measured, one might erroneously conclude that the explanatory variable is the cause of the response. For example, one may erroneously conclude that firemen cause fires. Isn't that interesting? Obviously, the firemen are associated with burning houses. They're always there when a house is burning. It's a mistake to think that they are the cause of the fire. Both they and the burning house are co-occurring because of a third confounding variable, the actual fire. Consider what will occur if confounding variables are not taken into account. Treatment that is working could be judged to hurt patients. Typically, clinicians complain that in analysis of their patient's severity of illness was not adequately accounted for. They claim that patients under their care would have died anyway if it were not for their few they saved. Inadequate adjustment for severity of patient's illness leads to the mistake of attributing their deaths to heroic efforts to save them. This is akin to blaming the fire on the fireman. Suppose 10% of patients report their attitudes on the web and 40% of patients who write a comment on the web are negative about us. What percent of our patients are truly dissatisfied? On the assumption that reporting on the web is independent from satisfaction levels, we expect a total 4% of patients to report on the web and complain and 46% to not report on the web and be dissatisfied. This will set the rate of dissatisfaction among our patients at 50%, which is higher than the 40% that actually complain. In statistical inference, we want to make sure that the sample represents the population. Otherwise, prototypical patients not in the sample are ignored, leading to erroneous conclusions 
about the population of patients. We don't want out of sight patients to be out of our mind. For most managers, randomization is not possible. Few businesses can afford to randomly assign their customers to services. Therefore, they have to come up with an alternative method to create equivalent groups of patients. Since randomization is not always possible, an alternative is to make sense of data as they occur. This type of studies are called observational studies. Generally, data in observational studies are collected only by monitoring what occurs. While experiments require random assignment, in observational studies, patients and providers do what is best for them, and data on their outcomes is used to find out what worked well. Each patient encounter is recorded in electronic health record and the outcomes of these encounters provide a telltale to detect if the interventions are working. Observational studies come in two forms, prospective and retrospective. A prospective study identifies individuals and collects information as events unfold. For instance, medical researchers may identify and follow a group of similar individuals over many years to assess the possible influences of behavior on cancer. You see this when an entire population of a city are followed over time. Retrospective studies collect data after events have taken place. For example, managers may review past events in medical records to see which treatments are working. The availability of medical records have made it easier to conduct retrospective studies. Two groups of patients are examined. First is the group exposed to treatment. They are called cases and they are followed to see their outcomes over time. Then there are patients not exposed to treatment. They are called controls and they are examined to see outcomes in the population of controls before treatment was given. It's important to make sure that cases match the controls in every possible way except for the treatment. Almost all statistical analysis are based on the notion of implied randomness or equivalence of treatment and control groups. If observational data are not collected in a random framework from a population, these statistical methods are not reliable. Efforts must be made to match cases to controls. For each case in the treatment group, one randomly selects a control patient that is similar in all relevant variables except exposure to treatment. The Viax study is a good example of how retrospective match case control studies work out. This medication was withdrawn from the market when it was shown that cases treated with this medication were twice more likely to have a cardiac event than matched controls not treated with this medication. At the time of the study, YX was had sales exceeding a billion dollars. The take-home lesson in this lecture is that in observational studies, controls are matched to cases in all relevant variables except for exposure to treatment.